Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good night, because that's running in different time zones. Uh, and I'm going to do an announcement that you can choose for this session an interpretation because we might have some participants from the Central Asian region. And uh, if you prefer to listen to the Russian interpretation, you can choose to click on the globe icon at the bottom of the screen and choose one of the two languages, English or uh, Russian. The session itself will run in English, but the Russian interpretation is available. Внизу экрана с правой стороны нажмите на глобус, если хотите выбрать русский перевод. Сессия будет на английском. And uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, a 24 hour marathon. We're celebrating environmental uh, rule of law. We're in the middle of the marathon. This, this session comes towards the, the second half of it, but by far not uh, the end. Uh, we had another event that was done for the European region earlier in uh, at 10 o'clock this morning. It was an excellent event, really interesting discussion on uh, environmental law and uh, climate crisis. And uh, now we're moving to the second event for the Europe and Central Asia region, but also covering global um, issues. And uh, there will be another one following uh, this. Uh, so the marathon will continue. My name is Mariana Bolshikova. I am a law and governance coordinator at UNEP's office for uh, Europe and we work in the 56 countries in the pan-European uh, region. Uh, this event, uh, first few housekeeping matters. Uh, so this event will uh, have the possibility for the participants, and lovely to see how many participants online, to ask questions to uh, the presenters uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, where you see the two little icons in it, Q&A. Please post your questions there. Uh, and you can also share your thoughts, your comments, your views in the chat box right next to it. So please use the chat for comments and the Q&A for your questions. We will have uh, several presentations from the really interesting panel today. And we'll start with two, and then we'll have a little break for questions and answers so that we break the flow a little bit. Um, and so we encourage you to post your questions already in the first uh, half an hour while our very distinguished uh, and, and known speakers are presenting. So please post your questions so that uh, we can take them up in the first uh, break for questions and answers um, about 20 five, 30 minutes into the session. Then we'll have several more presentations, three more presentations and another question and answer session. So please keep posting your questions and click, keep posting your comments in uh, the chat uh, box at any time. Um, so what we're talking today in this session about is a transboundary nature of environmental problems, because of course, environmental problems and challenges do not have borders. They don't know borders. Pollutants travel with air currents. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions in one part of the world lead to warming, desertification, and raise of water levels in another. Massive technological development in some countries often results in mounds of hazardous waste in others. Uh, there are disappearing species that are being trafficked across uh, borders. And uh, there are also challenges uh, on the borders between two neighboring countries very often because of uh, activities happening in one and impacts uh, occurring in another. So we will be talking about how we address this uh, through legal tools and in particular international multilateral environmental agreements where we've succeeded where we still have a lot of work to do what are the opportunities and what are the challenges in using MEAs the multilateral environmental agreements to address transboundary environmental problems and we've got an excellent panel uh, today we are covering some treaties that are global in nature 
and we are covering some treaties that are specific in Europe and Central Asia region and have been kind of pioneering in uh, looking at environmental problems through a prism of international law at the regional level. With that, I want to move straight into uh, the panel and uh, give the floor to uh, our colleague Sophie Flensberg. Uh, Sophie has had over 20 years of experience in environmental law, uh, starting her career in uh, Denmark with the Ministry of Environment and then uh, moving on to uh, the UNECE, the Economic Commission for Europe of the United Nations. Uh, and then UNEP, and then back to the Danish government working on UN and, and, and World Trade Organization. And for the past six years, she's been a legal officer with the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, that's the CITES Convention. And she's recently taken over as the interim chief of the Outreach and Projects Unit of that secretariat. So Sophie, over to you. Thank you, Mariana, for that uh, comprehensive uh, introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen. I don't know if it, I succeeded in that. Can you let me know if you can see my screen? Yes, we okay, can. Cool. Excellent. So without further ado, I think I should move right into it because um, to do justice to CITES in, in 15 minutes is in, already in itself uh, an opportunity, but also a challenge. Um, right now, as we speak, we have a three months course going on in south of Spain, where they are literally focusing on the convention for three months, uh, full, full time. So, you know, boiling down that to, to 15 minutes is a little bit of an issue, but we'll try. So, so what I'll speak about is um, a little bit about what the convention is, how it works. Uh, what are we actually talking about when we talk about global trade and, and, and illegal trade, as you mentioned, which crosses the borders? We have traffic um, of um, illegally sourced um, wildlife, both animals and plants. And how do we do? A, how do we cope with that? Which is um, a big challenge. Then I'll give you one slide about the governance structure um, because that will help you understand the two examples that I'm going to give to you at the end about, uh, about how CITES has been important and useful in this particular region. And then we can have a little bit of a discussion of the challenges and opportunities that you mentioned. So diving right into it, um, CITES is an international um, convention. You already gave us the full title just before. Um, it's it's a convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora. And while the, the, the title talks about endangered species, it actually also covers species that are not yet endangered, but might be it on, might become endangered unless um, trade is fully controlled. So that's why uh, we use the word endangered, but it is a, a little bit more than that. It's a little bit broader than that. <clears throat> It's an old convention. It's turning 50 years next year. It was signed in, in 73, it was actually agreed at the Stockholm conference uh, in 72, of which we're marking the 50 years uh, this week, um, agreed that we would need a convention like this. And uh, since it was all, all, almost done because it'd been negotiated under the IUCN, the auspices of the IUCN, the International Union for Nature Conservation, um, the convention was signed uh, on the 3rd of March in 1973, and it entered into force on the 1st of July, 1975, which was quite fast um, for that, for this type of convention. We have uh, over 30,000 species listed in the three appendices. I'll come back to that. Um, and at this, uh, as to date, we, there are 184 countries that are signed up and, and legally bound by the convention. Sorry, that's 183 countries and the European Union, uh, to be absolutely correct. Uh, in, in the European, bigger European Central Asian region, we're only missing uh, Turkmenistan um, to have all countries as parties to the convention. So any, if there are any Turkmen in this, in this uh, call, it would be interesting to hear if they're making any moves towards um, accessing to the convention. <clears throat> uh, CITES, as I mentioned, is a multilateral legally binding agreement. It operates through an intergovernmental process, which is the COP, which I will come back to. It is an international regulatory, frame, regulatory framework of trade in wild plants and animals. Um, to, as is legally binding, parties must adopt national legislation 
um, <clears throat> to uh, to actually implement and enforce the convention at the national uh, at the national level because it's not self-executing. So you have to have uh, authorities at the national level. Uh, they have to be designated formally designated so they can operate and, and issue legally binding uh, permits and certificates. And in the national legislation, there has to be um, penalties uh, that are established so that you can um, penalize trade in violation of the convention that we will talk about illegal trade. We'll come back to that as well. So, so these are things that the international framework puts in the, the international frame, if you like, but at the national level, there still needs to be implementing legislation um, to complement the international framework. And the, the convention is aimed at achieving both conservation and sustainable use objectives. Um, so what are these uh, objectives? It is to ensure that wild fauna and flora in international trade are not exploited in an unsustainable way. So all trade in situs listed species must be sustainable. Um, it must be legal and it must be traceable. What do we mean by this? We mean that by legal, we mean that the specimens, so the actual thing in trade, we call it a specimen in situs because it's a product, it's a live animal, it's um, potentially a part of an animal such as a rhino horn, but it could also be a final product um, such as uh, um, well, we'll get back to some of the examples, but it could be cosmetics that have orchids in them or caviar, which is a possibility. So, um, so all of these have to, the, the specimen have to be legally obtained, which means in accordance with national laws or regulations for the protection of fauna and flora. And this has to be confirmed by the management authority. The management authority is the authority, as I said before, that are issuing the permits or the certificates, and they have to be satisfied that whatever is being traded has a legal origin. So I cannot go out and take something in the forest without a, uh, illegally because it's not the season or because it's not my, it's not allowed to take something in the forest that's covered by CITES and then ask for a permit. I have to be able to document that what I have taken was, I was allowed to take. So that's the legal part. By sustainable, we mean that parties must make a non-detriment finding, which is a science-based finding that confirms that the trade in the species it will not be detrimental to the survival of the species in the wild. And this is a, a little bit complicated, so I won't go into more detail here. It's just um, an assessment of how much can I take in the wild and will there be a threat to the survival of the species in the wild if I take this. So it's a, a sort of assessment of the risks involved with um, trading that particular species. And by traceable, we mean that there must be uh, a permit and uh, or a certificate and these must be reported um, through the whatever has been authorized through a permit or a certificate must be reported to the site secretary every year so let me accelerate a little bit um, uh, yeah so I put in the little box of safe because of the pandemic we have discussed whether CITES has a role to play to ensure uh, that trade is safe for human health and wildlife health we haven't made, there hasn't been a COP since the pandemic has um, occurred. So there's been no decisions uh, in this respect yet, but it could, it is an, um, on the agenda of the next COP. So that's uh, an opportunity we can discuss as well. Um, with regard to the CITES scope, uh, it's important to note that the, the convention covers not only export, but it also regulates import, which means that there are also rules with regard to how you can import and what are the controls you need to make when you import. It also covers re-export and it covers introduction from the sea, live animals and plants, live debt, uh, live debt, parts and derivatives, as I mentioned before, finished products. And when I talk about re-export, it's important, uh, for instance, in a country like Switzerland, where I'm based, um, that Switzerland will import a lot of wild skins, skins from wild animals, as you can see here on the, on the, on the slide, and make watch straps, because Switzerland has a huge uh, watch industry. And if they make watch straps out of a product that is originally a situs animal living, um, uh, that is originally a situs animal, they need to issue permits for the re-export of these watch straps. So just to give you an, a sense of how large scope this convention has. So Switzerland, for instance, issuing over 100,000 permits every year for that reason. Um, uh, I put here an, a sort of examples of species, but you should note that uh, most of the species are included in Appendix 2, uh, whereas a small minority in, in, is included in Appendix 1, only 3%. 
Um, and interestingly enough, the, the very vast majority of species inside us are plants. They're not animals, they're not charismatic animals, they're not charismatic mammals, they are plants, they're mostly trees and orchids and, and other types of plants. Um, and that's how we get to the 30,000 because about 1,000 species, 30,000 species of orchids included in the appendices. What does it mean when it's included in one of these three appendices? It means this, if a species is included in appendix one, which we have 3% of the species that are included there, trade is generally prohibited. Um, and when we say trade here, we mean commercial trade or trade for commercial purposes, um, because we consider species in appendix one threatened with extinction. Species included in appendix two, which I certainly showed before is 97%, are not necessarily at this point threatened with extinction, but um, we must regulate and control trade to avoid that they become threatened, which means that trade in these species is permitted, but controlled and um, species in appendix three are not yet uh, threatened at a global level, but could be, and we're asking for more monitoring this trade so we can assess whether um, listing in appendix one or two is necessary. Um, the next two slides will be very quick, just to show you a couple of examples of, of economic sectors that rely on wildlife trade. Um, caviar uh, is one of those. So we have food, we have furniture made out of uh, exotic uh, uh, tree species. There could be cosmetics that would be made with plants and, and even sometimes caviar. Um, we have leisures, we have hunting trophies, we have trade in wild uh, birds, birds of uh, hunting birds, etc. tourism uh, and fashion. So just to give you a, a few examples of, of types of products that are covered by the convention. We don't have a good uh, estimate of the, the value of the trade, but we have some numbers of some types of products that we can with some certainty say that th there is a lot of trade in queen conch, there are a lot of trade in snake skins, and there is a lot of trade in big leaf mahogany, which are all species uh, types of species that are included in the convention. They could be billions of US dollars, but we're, we're having now a project ongoing to, to determine in a bit more, with a bit more certainty, what is the, the actual value of trade? Um, I mentioned illegal trade, and this involves both specimens that cannot be commercially traded. So these species that are in appendix one, um, which for instance includes um, uh, all the, the big cats. So it could be um, tigers, et cetera, in these iconic species such as elephant with some exemptions, um, the pangolins that you saw a picture of before. So specimens that that spe species that cannot be traded for commercial purposes or specimens that could be traded with, but the permit has not, is not in order. Either it's invalid or it's not there, simply not there. So these are the two types of, of illegal trade. And uh, the problems with illegal trade, obviously, is that it undermines legal trade. Um, it involves often transnationally organized groups. It can threaten conservation of wild species and biodiversity. And it goes beyond iconic species. There is um, illegal trade in, in over a thousand different species. So it's not only elephant ivory, even if a lot of it is that, as you can see from this, from this, um, from this uh, pie. Um, so just quickly on the governance structure, uh, it's, it's very simple. We have a conference of the parties, which is uh, basically a body that has the supreme decision-making power or mandate that meets every three years and um, most importantly decides on whether to include new species in the, three in the two appendices, appendix one or appendix two, um, and decides on modernizing the processes um, through the, the over 100 resolutions that are basically adding to the regulation of trade. There, is a, there are two scientific committees and then there is a standing committee which meets uh, the years when the conference of the parties is not meeting. In this region, members of that committee are Russian Federation, Belgium, Israel, and Poland, and the alternates are Georgia, Spain, Belarus, and Ireland. Um, so these are the countries that will have decision uh, capacity in the standing committee um, that just met this March in, in Lyon. Then we have the Secretariat and we have UNEP providing some services to the Secretariat. Um, the regions that I wanted to, the examples that I wanted to mention is obviously there are two. One is the Saika antelope, which is, I think, important for a number of the Central Asian countries, uh, hopefully represented on this call. Um, 
China, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, but also uh, uh, Ukraine, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Russian Federation, and also a few more European, Poland and Moldova. And uh, this species is critically, critically endangered. It's included inside this Appendix 2 for now. There has been proposals to move it to Appendix 1, but for now it's in Appendix 2. But there can be no trade for commercial purposes. They adopted this um, sort of uh, add-on. So it's in Appendix 2, but there is no trade in the species taken in the wild for now. What are the threats to the saiga? Um, it's subject to hunting, uh, and then uh, obviously also trade in hunting trophies, land use change, climate change, uh, illegal and legal trade, and the uh, episodic disease that uh, events, which one, one of them happened in 2016. Fortunately, and this is why this is a good story, the species has uh, signif significantly recovered, and now there's only a, over a million of these species um, in the region. And this is thanks to the action by, by the countries, by the rain states, both in the context of CITES and in the context of the Convention on Microchoice Species, under which there is a memorandum of understanding on how to collaborate on the, on the species. There are a couple of decisions that were decided by the COP uh, in the last uh, COP in, in 2019, and there will be new decisions at the next COP. And the other example I wanted to just mention is the peregrine falcon, which is um, a species that, that is uh, widely distributed. Uh, but in which there is quite a lot of trade. Um, and in this particular region, there are a lot of countries that are exporting uh, these animals. And there are also a number of countries that are importing. And as you can see um, on this little figure at the bottom, um, almost exclusively uh, trade in specimens that have been born in captivity, which means that they have not been taken or, or bred in captivity. They have not been taken in the wild. They have been produced in facilities that produce these kinds of uh, animals. So they're not uh, actually traded in the wild, traded, taken in the wild for trade. They're produced in captivity, but they're still covered by the, by the regulations under the convention, even if they're um, bred in captivity. So these were um, my quick presentation. Um, if you wanted to discuss a bit about the opportunities and challenges, we can do that. Um, but for now, I just wanted to leave it at that and then perhaps um, hopefully we will see you at COP19, which will be in November in Panama, um, and registration is open and everybody is most welcome to join us in Panama. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie, and Panama is a great place to go, so <laughs> I wish we go. Uh, thanks very much. I think that uh, one thing I uh, took away is the importance of regulating treaties uh, on transboundary issues at national level and getting clear regulations. The other thing that I took away is that you should very carefully watch Swiss watches <laughs> because there is clearly something there. Um, okay, now going on from from uh, from this uh, point, and again, I, I I encourage everybody to 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 post their, your comments and questions uh, in uh, in the chat. Um, going on to the next presenter, uh, who is uh, Jerzy Jędroszka. Professor Jędroszka is uh, at Opole University in uh, Poland and uh, at the Riga Graduate School of Law in uh, Latvia. That's where he teaches, as well as a regular lecturer at several other European universities. Jerzy has been instrumental in a number of intergovernmental negotiation processes, including the Aarhus Convention, the SCA Protocol, the ESCO Convention, and certain various capacities um, and, and of these conventions, including the Compliance and Implementation Committees. Uh, and uh, he also has absolutely amazing vast experience in uh, drafting environmental legislation and helping countries draft environmental legislation, particularly on matters related to environmental impact assessment, strategic environmental assessment, and uh, public participation, both in Poland, but also abroad in, uh, in the EU, as well as in uh, the eastern part of uh, the region and Latin America and Caribbean. And I was this give a floor to Yiji, who will talk us through some of the regional treaties that have been uh, breakthrough treaties in uh, in our part of the world. So I hope Yiji is online. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, and we can see you. Okay, perfect. I'm I'm just trying to present my. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
first of all, uh, thanks for the presentation, and I apologize for the uh, for the presentation, which is not fancy at all. I'm a boring lawyer, so so it's it's really no drawings, no no pictures, nothing. It's it's just pure. Uh, uh, reference to legal acts just to, to uh, illustrate what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk is first about the main challenges related to two examples uh, uh, of uh, rule of law, environmental rule of law, issues and one is the public involvement and the second is uh, addressing uh, transboundary damage and procedures uh, uh, transboundary procedures and uh, then i would like to show the principles and uh, to elaborate a little bit about the legal framework without however uh, presenting in details, there is no time for, for this. I really appreciate Sophie being able to uh, uh, really present CITES convention. I don't feel uh, like able to present uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the content of the Aarhus convention and ESPO convention. I would rather list the issues. And then at the end, uh, uh, I would conclude with the role of promoting environmental rule of law uh, which was uh, enhanced by introducing these two, uh, well, it's more actually than just these two main uh, legal instruments in the region. Uh, uh, Ishan, sorry, and... can, could you go in the, your presentation, can you click on the presentation mode because we can also see the slides on well, the side. That's what I did. Okay, but that's okay, but we can see the main slide anyway, so that's fine. But you, you want to see the, the, the entire presentation or what? No, this is okay. You, please, please continue. It's, it's, I think it's visible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. now it's a presentation mode. Okay. Yeah, that's what I had, but okay. So mm -hmm. first of all, our region, uh, Europe mostly, uh, had similar problems as, as many other regions in the world. These, are, these were the administrative traditions in which secrecy was a rule. Uh, even democratic countries, participation of the public and access to justice was limited at most to protecting subjective rights. Therefore, no really room for, for those willing to protect wider public interests like uh, 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 environmental issues. Legal framework generally was focused on domestic issues, on protecting, protecting uh, uh, at most its own environment, its own people. Uh, there was no uh, uh, really a tradition of cooperation with the neighbors in other countries, even though they were similar problems, and then in the mid 20th century, uh, it started to be elaborated some new concepts of generally of the open society, participatory democracy that would extend this, this thin democracy uh, as if it was called to more participatory model of uh, administrative decision-making or running the country generally. And that was, uh, 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 that coincided with the uh, need for more integrated preventive approach to environmental issues, to understanding the horizontal and transboundary nature of environmental problems. And that all, resulted in uh, uh, starting to develop some international principles, which uh, were codified somehow in the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, which itself, as you all know, uh, uh, did not have a binding legal nature. It was just a political declaration, but very useful. 
and uh, uh, following this, there was some development in the international law, uh, which both in the treaties and in the customer environmental law by, by a series of, of uh, cases, developed some more binding rules. And then I will, I will just shortly present you uh, uh, in the real declaration, we all know this famous principle 10 about public involvement and this three pillars, uh, access to information, public participation, decision-making and access to justice, which were a prerequisite for effective environmental protection. So that was about the public involvement. Also, the issue of transboundary harm was addressed uh, in a, originally it was the trade smelter case. Uh, you might uh, remember that was uh, uh, between uh, the Canada and, and the United States. Uh, uh, and that was the first elaboration of a principle that states have responsibility for environmental damage uh, resulting from activities in their territory. And that was uh, uh, elaborated in the Principle two of the Rio Declaration, responsibility for transboundary environmental damage. And following this, there were two other principles in the Rio Declaration about the need for transboundary procedures, other ways for, for the countries to uh, inform and to allow the other countries to participate uh, in case of transboundary harm. And that was partially embedded into the customary international law with the famous uh, uh, pulp mill case, uh, uh, Europe uh, International Court of Justice verdict, uh, which was uh, actually related to the case between countries in uh, Latin America. Uh, this, uh, developments, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to talk about this in, in, at length about the declarations because I, I'm pretty sure we all know this. Uh, what is important for the real declaration is that uh, the principle two related to the responsibility not only for causing damage to the environment of other states, but also of areas beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. And that is something which is only recently being uh, uh, developed with the uh, high seas negotiations, BBNJ so-called, where it is about our common responsibility for the state of, of the oceans. Uh, then we have this principle 18 uh, about notifying the states about uh, natural disasters and emergencies, and also about uh, uh, activities that may have a significant adverse transboundary environmental effect. Uh, and this is this principle 19 is commonly uh, until now associated with just notifying uh, states, other states, about the possibility of affecting environment in other states. And uh, the issue of this areas beyond national jurisdictions, as I said, it is still something to be developed. So uh, about the legal framework in Europe, about public involvement. Here, uh, Europe has managed to develop an extensive legal framework to cover this uh, issue of public involvement and somehow to implement this principle 10 uh, of the Rio Declaration. And that is first and foremost, it's Aarhus Convention, but also under the European Convention on Human Rights, there is no right to the environment, but the jurisprudence is, is really trying to capture some of the main essence of the Aarhus Convention requirements for the procedural instruments, access to justice, public participation, access uh, and access to information. In the EU law, we have a, a 
uh, European Union law. We have an extensive legal framework to implement this legal, uh, this, this international treaties, and especially Aarhus Convention, EU is, is a party itself, is a party to the Aarhus Convention. Therefore, it applies also, the principles apply also to EU institutions. And we have this regulated in the Aarhus Regulation, but also we have a, a number of secondary legislation which apply to member states and puts this uh, general obligations from the Aarhus Convention or other international instruments into specific obligations in specific uh, uh, sectors. And for the public participation, you see it applies to environmental impact assessment, strategic environmental assessment, integrated pollution prevention and control, or that's now industrial emissions directive, also to industrial accidents, to water, to habitat, to GMO issues. And then at the end, it all must be implemented by, I'm sorry, I just, by the, by the, uh, well, that's actually Geneva calling, <laughs> uh, uh, by the national law. The, uh, Overarching legal act is the Aarhus Convention, and that is a convention on access to information, public participation, decision-making, and access to justice in environmental matters, which was uh, adopted and signed in Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, uh, and then uh, it was, uh, uh, it entered into force quite soon. Now it has 47 parties in the region. Actually, it is also open to all countries of the UN. Uh, and, and there is some interest uh, on, on this and even one African country uh, submitted an application for this. Uh, this Aarhus Convention covers the three pillars of public participation, of public involvement, access to information, public participation and access to justice. I'm not going to get into details of, of these uh, issues uh, uh, I will, at the end, conclude about its uh, impact to the environmental rule of law. Now I would like to, to, to move to another issue, which is this transboundary harm or damage and transboundary procedure. Uh, this gradually have been embedded into a number of treaties, uh, mostly in Europe. Uh, related to shared resources, related to shared uh, seas, shared mountains, and so on. The details, and again, Europe, European region, is fortunate enough to have uh, some details of the procedure, because as I mentioned, the International Court of Justice uh, clearly indicated that doing this, in case there is one activity in one country can make a damage or harm an environment in another country, you need to perform an environmental impact assessment. However, the issue is about the details, how to do it, how to assess the damage and so on and so forth. And here, we are fortunate enough that, that under the ESPO convention uh, and then later on under the SEA protocol, we have the details how to do it really uh, uh, in practice. So that is a big help. We also have uh, 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 this Industrial Accidents Convention, which talks not about the prevention, but rather, well, in a way also, but, but about specifically activities that might cause harm by the accidents, not by the routine activity, as it is in case in ESPO Convention. Uh, and this uh, uh, experience, has been uh, uh, followed in the Central Asia region because uh, uh, it attracted also attention to countries which are not parties of UNEC uh, and the uh, riparian states of the uh, uh, Caspian Sea decided to follow this uh, uh, requirements by establishing transboundary environmental impact assessment rules 
to the uh, uh, Tehran Convention. In EU law, as I said, there is a number of uh, also rules that implement these general requirements, and they all harmonize national procedures, but also provide details of national procedure. And that all is uh, uh, further made much more detailed in the national uh, legislation. And again, as I said, the major piece of uh, our international treaty is the UN ESPO Convention on Environmental Impact Assessment in transboundary context. It relates to concrete projects, but uh, later on it was uh, uh, extended to plans and programs by so-called SCA protocol. So uh, uh, now to conclude, I think my time is, is, I have like three minutes. Mariana, is that correct? Uh, that's pretty much done, I think, with the time. So yeah. Okay, please. just very, very shortly. So what, what it contributed to, it established a, a, a common standard throughout the countries for decision-making to be more transparent, more participatory, and therefore more effective and more legitimate. The governments are much more accountable to the uh, uh, to their own society, and that all resulted in minimizing the risk of conflicts, both with its own public but also with neighbors, because this transboundary procedures. Sorry, that this is always. <laughs> The same, I didn't switch it off because I was expecting a call from Geneva. So uh, 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 with neighbors, because our activity can also create problems in another country and not following these rules can clearly be seen, be seen in a number of cases between the countries. Uh, and most recently we had a case in which I'm afraid my own government was uh, brought to the court for not following these rules. Uh, but also what it uh, uh, resulted, it was better understanding of environmental challenges, that it is not only about its own environment, it is not only about its uh, own people, that uh, environment of Sophie mentioned does not know borders, so uh, 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 then you need to address it in a more comprehensive way. And finally, what it's very important. There is this international standards, but also it is not left only to the national governments, but it is a standard that is monitored uh, uh, and the compliance is monitored by independent like international tribunals, Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee and ESPO Implementation Committee. Uh, uh, and they both uh, can be triggered uh, the procedures can be triggered also by the public, more or, or less independently or directly, but still, and that all provide uh, additional um, incentive for the governments to uh, uh, really uh, comply with this uh, standards. Uh, and that is something which I believe Europe, I mean, the, the UNEC region, uh, that covers not only Europe, but also Central Asia, is uh, uh, really very much benefiting. And uh, uh, I believe that could be considered as uh, something that uh, uh, on a wider scale could be replicated. And just a final word, we have had uh, uh, the Escazo agreement in Latin America, which was uh, following the path of the Aarhus Convention, but I, I, it was done on their own Latin American way. But the same principle was uh, 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 there as we had in Europe, except for one issue. Regretfully, in Europe, we considered responsibility of the governments towards the public at large, whether it's our own public or the public in other countries. And that, I'm afraid, in the Scazo Convention was not really uh, uh, followed. And then it is about 
uh, the standard uh, or the the, the uh, right of only the its own public, and it does not extend to the public of other countries, which I believe it, it is uh, a missed opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Yuzhi, so much. And, and, and I think this point about sort of creating at the regional level, taking the, the principles uh, from a, a policy document, a global policy document like the Rio Declaration, and uh, using that moment of the you know, fertility because of the political transition in Europe and creating these common standards, building on the international principles, uh is 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 one of the things that has been crucial uh in the european sort of international law development and in the environmental uh field and 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 the issue of having uh those standards reviewed for compliance uh, and having those effective mechanisms uh, that look at compliance uh, by independent bodies is also something that uh, that has been uh, instrumental over the past 20 years in this region um, I want to uh, basically just uh, say that we have a comment, uh, and, and I think that's more related to CITES, uh, and the comment is from Rosanna saying that uh, to improve forensic cases, all CITES species should have their genetic sequences in the databases, um, so I'll just read out that comment. I, ha I haven't seen any questions, but I do have one of my own, and if you could, um, both to Sophie and, and, and to Yeji, uh, if you can just say about a sentence uh, on, on this, uh, in terms of the, the top successes or the top challenges, uh, as you see in implementing transboundary legal frameworks in this region, if you had to name one or two, what those would be? Um, I, uh, one of the, well, one of the successes I've already mentioned, which is the Saiga Antelope for that, for this region has been a, um, it's been a very good collaboration, uh, both between the parties, the countries, but also between the Convention on Migratory Species and, and the Convention on International Trade, which both have the uh, SAIGA in their, in their uh, scope. So that is something that we, we're quite satisfied with and, and, and use as a, as a success. Um, I could also have given you um, a challenge or a, a, sort of an, a story that's not a good story, um, and that's the story of trade in sturgeon and, and paddlefish, mainly sturgeon products, uh, which is the caviar, um, because uh, that um, the, this, the sturgeons are sort of um, common to a number of countries in the region, and there was an agreement that these countries should try to come up with a a sort of a, an agreement on how to share the stock and how to agree on who can fish was, what. And this was made many years ago, this agreement that, that there should be an, um, every year and an, an agreement over this, the stocks in, of these species. And, and they, it never really materialized. And CITES was included, involved in this particular trade too late. And so there is hardly any trade in caviar from the region now uh, in, in wild wild caviar, I should say, because there's a lot of trade in, in caviar that has been produced in, in aquaculture facilities, both uh, in the region, but also in other regions, including China. Uh, so that is a story that we think is, is a sad story because basically CITES was um, not involved early enough to be able to recuperate the species at the time. There are still some species that is there's not the end of the story. They have not gone extinct, but there is definitely not enough at this point. Um, to uh, to allow for trade in, in wild taken uh, roe. Um, so that was just a, a little going forward. I, I think that um, there is more and more pressure on the, the natural resources and more and more pressure both on wild animals uh, and wild plants. Uh, and uh, I think we will see more and more um, opposition uh, towards trade in, 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 in wild take uh, resources taken in the wild. We can see trade in captive bread or trade in artificially propagated, so plantations, but we will see, I think going forward, more and more pressure to reduce trade in wild taken, be that animals or plants and, and more and more species being included in, in the appendices. And our systems are still coping, but I could see at a point in time where the, where the 
where it's simply going to be too difficult for our systems to manage. So as I said, for every time you issue, you have a shipment of something that is listed inside us, you need to have a permit. And I could see that um, there would, it would be difficult for the parties to keep up with the requirements and, and what you need to do to issue a permit. And so I've seen that already. Some countries are simply saying, well, we're not gonna allow any trade. It's simply we can't control it. We're just gonna stop trading, which could be considered as a precautionary approach, but it could also be considered as a sort of laissez-faire approach where a lot of trade would then go underground and be illegal and even less controlled and probably even less safe and, and less sustainable. So that is not a solution because trade is not gonna happen just because you're saying it's not, it's not allowed anymore. So I think that that balance between regulating trade in a way that you are actually able to implement the regulations you have agreed you would, in, uh, you would uh, implement uh, versus just forbidding everything because it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to enforce, but it's not actually going to be a solution because trade will then be, as I said, uncontrolled, uh, unregulated and, and definitely unsustainable and definitely less safe um, from a, a human and wildlife health perspective. Um, so that's my two cents. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sylvie. Yuzi? Uh, yeah, I would mention three achievements and two challenges. The achievements, uh, it's basically what I mentioned. It is this common standard for more than 45 countries. Uh, and these are countries of different traditions, of different uh, uh, structures, but they apply more or less similar standard of, of uh, public involvement, of uh, informing the other countries about uh, uh, activities that might harm them. So that is achievement. Second, uh, also taking into account that the environment and the harm to the environment and people affected, it is not only about our own business uh, and that we need to see it in a broader perspective. Also think about the people abroad, foreign public, let them speak, let them uh, participate. And finally, this uh, uh, independent review, this, this two bodies that really uh, uh, could be used and the very existence of this possibility, I think it's very important. So these are the achievements. Uh, it, even, I mean, in countries that might themselves have a very well-developed framework, this framework can always be changed domestically. And if this is an international standard, this is much more uh, difficult if or should in the country be a, a, a political force that would not be so much uh, uh, interested in promoting uh, uh, participatory democracy. And that happens, and that is one of the challenges. Aarhus Convention was child of its time, the same as the ESPO Convention. It was at the time where Europe was taken by this wave of democratic changes. I'm afraid that's over. Uh, I actually, I did see in, in Latin America similar kind of uh, mood I was privileged to participate in Aarhus, but also in, in Escazu. And I felt pretty much the same kind of uh, approach as, as in Europe uh, uh, towards more democracy. We want more public involvement. Uh, in Europe, I'm afraid uh, this is not uh, uh, anymore. And in many countries, you would clearly see uh, um, a retreat to own national interest and not so much uh, willing to see damage to the environment or not so much uh, willing to look at the harm made to other countries or other uh, citizens. So that is a, a process. And what is the second challenge? Unexpected, I must admit. You all might know that we in Europe, there is now this European Green Deal with uh, like a leapfrogging towards uh, a more climate change, more sustainable development. So something very positive, but as usually opposition to more rights to the public was uh, made by those who uh, were at the same point, not so much convinced to the need for environmental protection. 
all of a sudden now, those advocating very much this Green Deal, some of them are very much op uh, afraid that too much of public participation, too much of access to justice for the public might be uh, uh, an obstacle for promoting sustainable development. And that is the totally new factor, which I'm, I must admit, I'm, I'm very surprised to, to, to see, but it may, it may be uh, um, a significant challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very thought provoking. Uh, actually, that's that's really, I, I would say surprising if you think about it, but it is very thought provoking. Um, and there's a question about access to justice based on the Aarhus Convention, and I think you partly addressed it that if that convention is applied, yes, there is there is a, a access to justice uh, aspect to that. Um, uh, and that's an important part of the convention. Um, I'm going to move now to um, the next speaker, and uh, that is uh, Owen McIntyre, who is a professor at the School of Law, University College uh, Cork, and the director of the LLM uh, program and a co-director of the Center for Law and Environment. He is the editor of the Journal of Water Law and served as inaugural chair of the IUC and World Commission on Environmental Law Specialist Group on Water and Wetlands, and also is a panel member of the Project Complaints Mechanism for the EBRD and the Scientific Committee of the European Environment Agency. Uh, he consults widely in the field of international water environmental law for the World Bank, ADB, UNDP, the European Union, and also advises river basin commissions around the world on transboundary water cooperation. And Owen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mariana. Um, I hope you can hear me and see my presentation. Yes. Um, I was asked uh, to talk about in the in the context of the environmental rule of law about transboundary environmental governance having special regard to um, the role of the UNEC Water Convention. And of course, when I started to prepare some comments, uh, typically at the last moment, um, I, I was left with the question, well, how would I begin to introduce this in, in 10 minutes? You know, because it's it, the contribution of the UNEC Water Convention has been absolutely enormous to the rule of law value of international water law. So to start with, I'll just say a few words about the structure of international water law. In the 30 years or, or so that I've worked in this area, um, the international water law has become considerably more developed. There is now a very, very broad consensus around a small core of rules and principles, of key rules and principles, particularly around three basic rules. The, the substantive rule of equitable and reasonable utilization for the sharing or the apportionment of shared water resources in a transboundary basin. The, and that's understood to be the cardinal rule. The related uh, principle of, uh, or the duty to prevent significant transboundary harm or the no harm rule. And then the predominantly procedural uh, uh, broad uh, duty or obligation upon states to cooperate. And we normally understand that as a sort of portmanteau um, obligation involving a whole range of um, procedural obligations, informational obligations, obligations between states to communicate and share information depending on the circumstances. It may be an issue or a dispute surrounding a new project. It may be about new uses. It may be around ongoing you know, environmental problems. So tied to these three key rules, two substantive and one procedural, we have a whole host of ancillary requirements. And this is the typical structure of any uh, international water law agreement, whether it be a, a, a regional convention like the UNEC Water Convention or a bilateral agreement or a basin level agreement. And these ancillary requirements involve rules regarding notification of new projects or planned measures, um, exchange of information on an ongoing basis between uh, uh, watercourse states on the conditions of the, of the basin, of the water resources, of the ecosystems, 
and on you know, activities that may impact on those conditions. And of course, uh, other obligations regarding things like ecosystems protection, which are becoming quite highly evolved. And we now understand as involving a whole raft of elements around, of elements around um, um, the, the protection of environmental flows, the uh, maintenance of ecosystem services, the protection of species, the prevention of invasive species, et cetera, et cetera. Now, as a framework, international water law, by definition, from the very beginning, has been designed to be flexible in terms of its implementation, its elaboration, implementation, and application. Now, if you think about it, that makes perfect sense because it's a way of trying to, to find a framework for cooperation between states in very different positions, upstream states and downstream states. Though that's the key um, uh, fault line, if you like, between upstream states that um, would often feel that perhaps they, they uh, should ought to be able to do what they, what they wish with water resources that naturally occur within their territory, and downstream states that feel that they should be restrained in terms of what they do so that downstream states may also enjoy um, uh, you know, corresponding benefits. Now, very often tied to that fault line, there's a fault line between more and less developed states. So, you know, and more developed states will tend to feel that well, their, their water uses will tend to be um, entrenched uh, and they will feel that you know, their interests ought to be protected against rising states, states that are now starting to have a major demand for water, for industrial processes, for irrigation, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of fault lines here to try and agree a common framework that is acceptable to all parties, regardless of the stage in their development, regardless of their political or social or economic systems, regardless of their, uh, their place in the basin, most importantly, is very, very difficult. So, you know, to illustrate that, the key cardinal rule, equitable and reasonable utilization, involves an accommodation based on a structured consideration of relevant factors. Now, of course, that makes it quite nebulous. Uh, similarly, if we look at the no harm rule, it's based on due diligence standards of state conduct. And of course, due diligence and the standard of due diligence expected of a state is influenced by a whole range of factors, including the seriousness of any harm or potential harm, the state of development of that state, um, etc. So, you know, we end up with a system that is flexible, that can accommodate multiple types of diverse interests, but it is inevitably normatively indeterminate. It is unclear. It is vague. It is nebulous. It is, you know, it, it just uh, uh, is unclear. So in other words, we are left with rules and principles which have uncertain implications and which have uncertain or unclear outcomes as to how they might be applied. So there is tremendous scope for disagreement in the states. Um, and that takes away from, if you think of the, the Malcolm Shaw, the international lawyer who talked about, international law's role is to provide shared objectives, you know, as a starting point to further negotiation. So I thought I should look at three elements. First of all, environmental protection to look at. And I, the reason I talk about this normative indeterminacy is because the UNEC convention and the UNEC uh, as secretariat to that convention plays an absolutely critical role because this is the only global convention and of course it is now a global convention it's the only global convention that has a secretariat that has a champion that is highly capacitated technically um, and diplomatically and that is developing guidance and practice etc which will inform the rules of international water law on a global level if we look at environmental protection article two of the of the water convention you know, sets out the key principles which inform its, its application and interpretation, preventive principle, precautionary principles, etc. Article three goes into tremendous detail on pollution prevention, including requirements around licensing, uh, licensing using best available technology or techniques, uh, requirements on wastewater treatment, requirements to set and establish environmental standards, uh, reference to the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem approach and ecosystems protection, the use of environmental impact assessment, the setting of water quality objectives, highly, highly, highly specific instrument, uh, which has had an enormous influence. Similarly, uh, requirements on water quality monitoring, 
It also allows for interaction with other multilateral environmental agreements, really, really importantly. And that includes both UNEC agreements, such as SBU, Aarhus, the Industrial Accidents Convention, but also others. Uh, Article 3, uh, subsection 2 of the Convention, specifically providing for standards and list of controlled substances that are set down in other instruments. For example, the, the, uh, the Stockholm POPs Convention, etc. So, you know, it incorporates by reference, if you like, all of this other wealth of international environmental law. And for example, just, you know, to, to demonstrate that role of the, the, the regime established by the Convention, supported by the Secretariat, you know, the first guidance that we have, meaningful guidance that we have on the ecosystem approach, dates to 1993, one of the first uh, instruments, technical instruments adopted under the auspices of the Convention after its adoption. So that's just typifies the kind of, of contribution that it has made. If we think about the all important paradigm of institutional cooperation, Article 9.2, a, a, a very unique provision, you know, requires the establishment of joint bodies. And the first time one reads that, you think, well, what kind of obligation could that be? Clearly, there's tremendous room for disagreement over what form any such body would take. But it makes this a requirement for the parties. And this recognizes the critical importance of permanent capacitated institutional mechanisms for effective transboundary water cooperation. In the absence of such institutional frameworks, the, 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 the rest of the key provisions and requirements of international water law are merely aspirational, unrealistically aspirational, I would suggest. And this is recognized and forcefully, uh, uh, you know. Uh, embodied, if you like, in this provision. That's now, of course, reflected in STG indicator 6.5.2, looking at you know, the, the formal institutional cooperation as, as one of the indicators under, under STG 6. That's supplemented by Article 6 and 13 on you know, structured exchange of information, Article 11, joint monitoring and assessment by states that share water courses. Article 14 and 15 on warnings and alarms and Article 15 on mutual assistance, straying into the idea of, of solidarity, if you like, between states that share a basin and their need to, to uh, cooperate with each other and to, to assist each other. Um, it just recognizes generally that this institutional cooperation is intrinsically connected to the substantive principles. You cannot have equitable and reasonable utilization without these institutional structures, or you can't effectively uh, hope to sort of implement the, the, the no harm requirement. It also facilitates other now, you know, very, very important paradigms such as cross-sectoral cooperation. It's in the context and under the auspices of the UNEC convention that we have the current cooperation between the Danube Commission and the Black Sea Commission which will be critical in addressing land-based sources of marine pollution. You know, we know that, that the vast majority of, land of, of marine pollution comes from land-based sources, how fault and rivers affect them. And then finally, the third element was that of a human rights-based approach. And once again, we see that this instrument has, has pioneered, if you like, this, this approach from, from you know, uh, even though the, the UNEC Water Convention only really stipulates that uh, the provision of information to the public and doesn't stipulate uh, public participation would have been extraordinary if it had in 1992. Um, it, the Secretariat and the, uh, the, the operational practice under the Convention has championed and pioneered public participation. And so it is seen as a sort of a, 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 an exemplar of this paradigm of, of uh, public, meaningful public participation. Of course, under the auspices of the convention, we then had the 1999 Protocol on Water and Health, which, you know, under its objectives, looks at you know, maximizing human health and well-being, both of an individual and collective character, the prevention of water-related disease, the provision of adequate supplies of wholesome drinking water, the provision of sanitation uh, of a standard adequate to protect health and the environment, and protection of drinking water sources and related ecosystems. So again breaking new ground. Remember, this is three full years before the adoption of general comment number 15 by the, the uh, UN Committee on the Economic and Social Cultural Rights. Uh, so, you know, absolutely groundbreaking instrument. And the Convention Secretariat now, of course, serves as one of the custodian agencies for SDG 6. And if we reflect on SDG target 6.1 and 6.2, we see that, you know, they are the next uh, iteration, if you like, of these 
uh, human rights based approach and values. So some 50 or in 2015, seven years ago now, some colleagues and I, we edited a volume on the UNEC convention uh, and its contribution to international water cooperation. I remember that volume ran, I have it here in front of me and I was looking at it again. And this ran to 550 odd pages and it could have been three times as long. You know, it, the, the contribution of this instrument in terms of regional and increasingly global transboundary effective uh, environmental governance and cooperation has been uh, monumental and continues to be uh, of critical importance. Thank you. I'm sorry if I've run over time. Well, thank you so much, Owen. And, and, and I'm taking away this very interesting factor of having the need for a very flexible and perhaps not very precise legal framework because of the competing interests and the competing and economic development stages of the participating uh, states, uh, but also this need for a strong technical capacity in the secretariat to kind of complement that, yeah. uh, that, that ambiguity and, and, and vagueness in the treaty and, and the need for this interaction with, with the other MAAs. And, and I'm also really interested that, that there's been this uh, increasing over time link to procedural rights uh, and, and the rights-based uh, approach. That's also quite an interesting uh, feature for what essentially is a, is a man technical management treaty, right, for, for, for a natural resource uh, in, in a particular sector. So. So that's, that's really interesting. Thank you so much uh, for this. I will uh, now move to our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Vadim Ni. Uh, Vadim is the chairperson of the Board of Socio-Ecological Fund, uh, one of the leading environmental NGOs in the Central Asian region. This organization works on raising public environmental awareness uh, and also supporting environmental activism and youth activism, protection of environmental rights and promotion of climate justice and nature conservation. And Vadim has been working in, uh, in the field of environmental law and media for over 25 years uh, and worked with the Ministry of Environment in his native Kazakhstan, but also for a number of international organizations, uh, the UN, uh, the, the development banks. Um, and uh, has uh, also worked at the regional level in uh, Central Asia and uh, Eastern Europe. Um, he served as a member of the Compliance Committee that we've heard from, from Yuji about. This is the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee and uh, is currently a member of the Compliance Committee of the UNECE Water and Health Protocol that Owen was just talking uh, about. So Vadim, over to you. Uh Thank you. Oh, we've got a bit of a sound yeah, problem. Uh, actually, you made a very comprehensive uh, better now. There is a background. Okay. Is it better or not? No? Yeah, just go ahead. There is a background, okay. but this is okay. We, we can see this uh, line. Thank you. Uh, there is a background. Um, no, sorry, I'm, I'm there in the hotel. Yeah, so it's uh, okay. Okay, not okay. Yeah. Okay, I will manage my uh, presentation like you. It doesn't work uh, somehow. The the uh, the this one. Okay, we'll try. Okay, oh, uh, I can, um, in essence, I can, after the introduction by Mariana, I can skip my uh, first slide because everything uh, about important about me was uh, said, already said by Mariana. So I, I would like first uh, to add a few words to the presentation um, uh, made by Sophie. You can see on the map that the, she mentioned about the past. You can see, see on the map was the, the main source of black caviar. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact number, except approximately 80 90 percent of uh, wild uh, caviar 
uh, from Caspian Sea. And now that I would say in, in essence, there is uh, for the uh, caviar production because uh, it has uh, the very important spawning uh, sites for uh, sturgeon. It's a uh, uh, Ural uh, River place which are located on the Kazakh territory. And, uh, now we almost uh, lost the sturgeon fishery. And, uh, there is almost no, and I would say it's a, a combination of uh, uh, factors which led to this situation. Uh, it's uh, first the the oil development uh, from the beginning of 1990s. Of course, it's uh, that uh, poaching, which took place uh, even before of that, and uh, and also the the significant reduction of the river flows from uh, Volga River and Ural River. That's also what uh, led to the loss of uh, the sturgeon fishery in uh, at least in Kazakhstan part. Now the caviar cost like a very precious uh, jewelry. Uh, and I uh, remember the time when I was in, it was, and I would provide the baseline. The, uh, at that time, uh, illegal, the illegal market, it was uh, easily to uh, change the I would say one kilo of uh, illegal caviar for one liter of water. Sorry, Vadim. Uh, I think the 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 bandwidth at your Vadim. The bad the the bandwidth at your end is very low. Uh, so maybe you can switch off the video. Okay. I, I will move uh, to another place. Uh, let me uh, let me one minute to move on place. Sorry, sorry. So maybe you can just switch off the video, and unfortunately, we won't be able to see yeah, you, yeah, but, yeah. but uh, we can hear you. Uh, I'm moving. We all sorry, know I'm how moving. the difficulties are with 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 the internet connection unfortunately that's part of this today's virtual world phone. that's uh is it better now yes it's a little bit better okay uh so i will continue my presentation that's uh by saying that uh, we almost lost the sturgeon fishery in uh in kazakhstan at least so it's uh, the cost is uh, caviar even on the local market is extremely expensive. Uh, Safi also mentioned that about Saiga. With Saiga, we have the up and down situation. And she mentioned about the population of 1.3 uh, million species. And just recently, I read the same news that the uh, population, the inventory on the territory of Kazakhstan has shown the 1.3 uh, million uh, species of Saiga. Maybe it is the same information, but please I can confirm that uh, we are now facing the improvement with the population of Saiga. But you can see that sometimes a uh, international convention even um, the side that the Soviet Union also, because Kazakhstan is a, was a part of Soviet Union, was a, uh, a party to the side convention. Nevertheless, sometimes even the international law is too late to save some species. But at least with, in some cases, we see the progress like in case of Saiga. Uh, my next uh, slide is about the Aral Sea. And uh, you know that Central Asia uh, is infamous about the 
uh, strategy of the RLC, which uh, was uh, before the 1960s, the fourth largest lake in the world. But then the, the, the extensive use of water for irrigation led that uh, for that to the situation when the uh, RLC lost almost all the water and the, the region is uh, had to deal with this issue. And um, from the beginning of 1990s, the, um, the International Fund for Saving of the RLC was established. And of course, it's important uh, institutional platform for the uh, transboundary cooperation of Central Asian countries. And it's not limited only to water governance, but also environmental governance. And more, uh, more recently, even on uh, climate adaptation. So I would say it's uh, important, still important, even though uh, Kyrgyzstan suspended uh, its membership um, in IFAS and its uh, affiliated organizations in 2016. But uh, if we will discuss the situation with um, the participation in three uh, UNEC convention, I would, I, would mention, I would like to mention that um, in case of the Helsinki Water Convention, it's a typical situation that three downstream countries are part of those conventions, but two upstream countries, in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, they are not members, uh, they are not parties to the Helsinki Convention. And um, with the ESPO Convention on EIA in transboundary context, which was uh, described and, uh, by Europe, uh, only Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are parties to this convention. And then now more actively, the uh, Central Asian countries are participating in the Arctic Convention. Uh, four or five uh, Central Asian countries are parties to the convention, namely Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. So uh, even Uzbekistan, uh, from time to time, they are uh, saying that they are going, they are going to join the convention. It didn't happen yet, but still, at least uh, Uzbekistan never uh, uh, saying that they will not apply the principle of the convention in, in international uh, negotiations or. Uh, regional negotiations or regional cooperation. So it works uh, at the regional level. Level, So it's uh, the convention influenced uh, access to uh, access to inf environmental information. And also public are engaged in uh, regional cooperation and represented at, in some of the regional environmental organizations. So you see that uh, and despite there is uh, the RLC um, fund, many issues they're still uh, solved on the uh, water sharing and water governance uh, on the basis of uh, a number of bilateral and tripartite agreements on water energy exchange of information uh, because uh, it's. Uh, some of the rules on the water sharing there were set even the, during the Soviet time. So the countries are trying to apply the new um, agreements to those Soviet rules on water sharing and, 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 and how the water governance works in the region. Now I'd like uh, to um, tell you the story that when uh, even not the transboundary cooperation, but the willingness of one 
country um, um, uh, lead us to the uh, improvement of the situation. Because I remember at the beginning of 1990s that uh, when people from the RLC region, they came to our office and they were desperate because in the RLC, uh, no fish were able to survive except flounders. And then in 2005, the situation uh, changed because the, the, there was a, a construction of dike, Pokaral, which was supported by uh, the World Bank. And now there are, we have almost more than 20 fish species in the uh, north, north part of uh, RLC and its fishery is restored. I think it's uh, the half of the uh, level or at the end of the Soviet time, well, no, Soviet period when, uh, when it was more or less situation was good with RLC. And now even fish are exported to Europe. Uh, on the next slide, I'd like to uh, present you the situation with bilateral cooperation between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. It's about the um, commission on Chu and Talas rivers. So, sorry, I uh, missed one A in between T and L. It was based on 2000 Kazakh Kyrgyz agreement on the use of water management facilities of intergovernmental status. And you can see on the uh, the map the names of those uh, water management facilities. And the idea was to uh, jointly, um, uh, jointly maintain of, uh, five management facilities which are located on the territory of Kyrgyzstan, but with the support from uh, Kazakhstan. And it was the basis to comply with the um, the oh, water sharing um, agreed during the Soviet time. And the bilateral commission was established in 2005 to provide the institutional framework for the negotiation of these issues and to review the compliance and implementation of the rules. And what is good with that commission, that the scope of the activities, actual activities of the commission um, is much broader than the scope of the 2000 agreement. Because it's, uh, it's again the situation when it's sometimes up, sometimes down, because the, during the kind of global pandemic, they, they reduced the, the activities uh, significant of the commission significantly reduced and hopefully they will restore the their cooperation in that commission and uh, but there is a some bad sign also that it's maybe not the case because there was also support from the gf undp and i think you name uh, project which supported the commission, but they, that project was completed before the pandemic. And now I'd like to move the, uh, the practical implementation of the ESPA convention, because we see that, um, uh, as I mentioned, two Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, are parties to the ESPA convention. But and they also included some provisions into the national law on transboundary impact assessment procedure. But actually, only, I know only one case when the procedure was tested in relation to the plant development of the Andash copper and gold deposits uh, located in Kyrgyzstan and it's uh, around, 25 kilometers from the border with Kazakhstan. So at that, at the beginning of 2000, I think it was in 2006, 2007, 
the public hearings were held in Talas, Kyrgyzstan in Kyrgyzstan and Taras in Kazakhstan. Similar uh, named cities with, uh, yeah, let's say, similar names. But it's uh, in two countries, yeah, that's uh, in two neighboring regions of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And I don't remember that the public hearings, the, the, the outcomes of the public hearings were taken into account by the, uh, the uh, developer and the public environmental public authority in Kyrgyzstan, at least there was a precedent of conducting public hearings and the, the procedure, at least at the national level, which was transboundary. I don't think it was fully uh, consistent with the ESPO convention, um, but Unfortunately, it didn't change the situation. And from that period, we have no other experience with the uh, implementation of the ESPO convention and application of the transboundary impact assessment procedure. Uh, there was also a case, um, I think two years ago when the National Environmental Authority of Kazakhstan uh, considered to request a transboundary impact assessment in relation to plan, to the planned construction of a nuclear power plant uh, in Uzbekistan, in, in, it's in the Jizakh region, also a neighboring region to Kazakhstan, because in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, the, there is a, some plants at some stage of uh, consideration of plans to construct a nuclear power plant. I don't think they it will the the project will be implemented, but at least there is a discussion of uh, uh, the construction of nuclear plants plants in three countries. Sorry, but Vadim, we'll need to, to wrap up soon because of the the the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm issues. finishing. I'm finishing. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, in essence that's uh, three examples of the application. I will not. Uh, uh, discuss the Aarhus Convention, just will mention that one, uh, the answer to one question which was raised in the uh, chat, that uh, I see in, uh, at least in Kazakhstan, the improvement of, with access to justice because of the Aarhus Convention. Uh, because when I began my professional career, uh, as an environmental lawyer, uh, I reviewed the cases at that time, all the uh, court cases initiated by the members of the public environmental cases. There were, uh, I would say 80% were by pensioners. So I, I was expecting that it's going down, but uh, like that's what is good that now we see at least number of cases, environmental cases, every year submitted by members of the public or environmental NGOs. It's not the same situation in other Central Asian countries, but at least in Kazakhstan, we see the progress with access to justice. We don't see, we don't win many cases, but at least there is access to justice say, and environmental litigation. Thank you, Vadim. Uh, I'm going to swiftly move to Nancy Isarin, who is the founder of Ambiendura and has been working on inspecting, investigating, and enforcing provisions regulating transboundary movement of waste since 1998. Uh, she started as an environmental uh, inspector and was a member of National Task Force on Serious Environmental Crime in the Netherlands. And since 2006, when she founded Ambiendura, she is supporting and leading European and international initiatives on controlling waste trade and disrupt illegal trafficking uh, of uh, environmentally sensitive goods, primarily uh, waste. She's working with the UN agencies and the banks uh, and also the European network for the implementation and enforcement of environmental law. Nancy, you cut the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mariana. Uh, I will try to share my screen now. Um, let me just open up the. Okay, can you just confirm you see the slide? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. 
Um, yes, good day everyone and uh, thank you Mariana for inviting me to uh, speak during this session to celebrate uh, the rule of, uh, environmental, uh, of uh, environmental rule of law already for so many years and also uh, congratulations to UNEP of course. Uh, I will be talking about the phenomenon of, uh, of waste crime and some of the challenges that we face uh, and uh, a way forward in, in terms of, uh, of pollutions, uh, solutions and it's a totally different uh, subjects than previous speakers. So um, yeah, I hope I, I can still entertain you uh, at this uh, late in uh, into the session. Um, well, I don't need to introduce uh, myself as Mariana already did. Uh, my name is Nancy Isaden and I'm an international expert uh, on environmental uh, enforcement of various international and regional uh, legislative frameworks. <clears throat> Um, so the main global framework uh, that exists uh, for waste is the Basel Convention on the Control uh, of Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste uh, and their proposal at uh, disposal. Uh, and this convention entered into force in 1992, so it's also uh, 30 years of age now. Uh, and it's also partly based on the principles in the in the Rio Declaration that was mentioned uh, by the second uh, by the second speaker. Uh, and also on top of the uh, Rio uh, uh, Declaration principles, also on uh, the Cairo guidelines and principles of the management of hazardous waste, which date from 1987. Uh, the Basel Convention uh, sets rules for transboundary movements of waste, uh, as it says in the title, uh, but also on the environmentally sound uh, management of waste. And within the European Union, uh, the provisions of the Basel Convention uh, have been implemented into the European Waste Shipment Regulation, uh, and some other European countries have also taken over uh, the main approaches that are laid down in the European Waste Shipment Regulation. Um, so in the first, the first question is, well, why is there a global waste rate to begin with? Uh, why, is, why is there a need or what, what does it what is the sense of shipping waste uh, across the globe and across uh, borders? Uh, well, uh, one of the reasons is that due to different standards for, for treatment of waste, uh, regulations and criteria to, to, for, for sites, waste sites to operate waste, uh, costs can be, be lowered. And in order to avoid uh, those costs, uh, exporters and waste generators will, of course, find uh, destinations uh, where they have to pay the lowest cost and uh, yeah the, the the chance of being inspected or or, or checked uh, is also uh, then in those cases uh, often lower uh, and secondly waste is more and more viewed as a uh, as a resource and in that sense it uh, <clears throat> it's becoming part of the normal uh, demand and supply uh, chain so uh, there is also uh, yeah, a business model behind shipping waste uh, across, uh, across the globe. Um, looking to waste crime and, the def and, and what is actually uh, a waste crime, uh, the Basel Convention uh, is one of the few conventions that has uh, defined uh, illegal act of waste uh, or waste trafficking uh, in, in, uh, in its provisions. And in that sense, the Basel Convention was quite ahead of its time. Uh, if you compare Basel Convention with, uh, for example, the Rotterdam or the Stockholm Convention or on chemicals and pops, uh, they do not define uh, illegal trafficking in, in those chemicals uh, in the, in the um, convention, uh, which makes it more challenging to enforce those regulations. And even though it's a convention, it requires implementation into the domestic legislative framework but having a definition of, of waste trafficking in the convention uh, is, is quite, uh, quite helpful and, and uh, yeah, gives a strong message that uh, parties to the Basel Convention should act upon uh, uh, illegal uh, excret waste. Um, so in order for countries uh, to, to combat uh, waste trafficking, it, it comes down uh, to, to three key elements. And if you look, uh, what is waste trafficking? very simplified said it's an illegal act with waste. Uh, so first illegal is a key element. So what is uh, unlawful or, or unauthorized? Uh, what, so what, what is the legal framework, what you can do and not do with waste? Uh, the second part is uh, 
what is happening with the waste. So in terms of transporting, processing, uh, recycling, uh, recovery, uh, final disposal, uh, or other uh, waste uh, operation uh, activities that can happen with waste. And the third, but uh, not last key element is what is actually waste. Uh, and I'm involved in this area uh, for over 24 years now. And there is always a discussion about when is something a waste or when it's not a waste, uh, when is it hazardous waste and when it's not hazardous waste. So even though it's quite, quite simple, uh, these, yeah, you have to, to prove that you're dealing with, an, with a case of waste crime. And, and if there is no clear uh, legislative framework, it, uh, it makes it quite challenging to, to have proper enforcement um, uh, of, uh, of the provisions. And then on top of that, uh, looking to the transboundary movements of waste, you're dealing with different jurisdictions, uh, which makes it extra challenging then for law enforcement authorities to, uh, to act properly. Yeah in this case. Um, so uh, what are some of the causes uh, of, of uh, illegal expert waste or, or what does facilitate um, waste crime? Uh, and first of all, again, coming back to the legislative framework, because that is the basis from which we, we, we can act, is unclear legislation. If there are no clear definitions in provisions, uh, it will make it very difficult for the inspectors law enforcement authorities and the prosecutors to, um, yeah, to actually act upon uh, the cases they, they, they come across. Um, secondly, uh, weak enforcement, uh, and this is also linked to what the second speaker mentioned on the political will for, for, for countries to, to implement uh, environmental legislation. Uh, weak enforcement, uh, yeah, not enough resources uh, for inspectorates and, uh, and other uh, bodies like customs or police, uh, if they do not have a sufficient mandate or sufficient manpower, um, the, the, the countries or the, the companies that want to uh, circumvent the rules, they uh, will, will know this soon enough and they will try to, for example, uh, when they are exporting waste, they will choose, for example, the, the port where, the, where there is the lowest chance of being uh, inspected. Uh, so this also then uh, facilitates for the, uh, for the um, exporters. Um, increased cost of legal disposal. If uh, what we see, for example, in, in the EU region, if costs for, for treatment of certain waste streams, uh, the costs go up, uh, you see that uh, the waste generators or the waste exporters will try to find alternative destinations to stay within the, 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 the framework or the legal boundaries, looking maybe for the gray area, uh, but we see that then they will try to find other destinations to avoid uh, or to lower the cost for, for the disposal of the waste. And as said, uh, waste is shipped all over the, the globe, so there's a whole logistical chain uh, behind it, making it very complex. Uh, also, if you look to the actors involved uh, on, the, on the waste treatment side, but also on the logistical chain, uh, the waste trade itself, so you're dealing with, for example, waste brokers, waste dealers, uh, exporters, uh, shipping companies. Uh, in order to follow uh, the, the shipment from, from starting point to end point, uh, it's close to impossible. And then again, linked with the transboundary movement aspect to it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very challenging uh, for law enforcement. So some of the impacts of, um, of waste trafficking, uh, obviously there's the, the impact on, on the environment and the, and the human health, uh, pollution of air, uh, water bodies and soil, but also uh, improper treatment of waste can, can in the end impact the, the food chain as we see with, uh, with plastic waste, for example. Um, a loss of jobs, uh, improper treatment uh, is carried out under worse and simplified uh, circumstances stances than when it would uh, have been, you know, if, if there, it would be proper treatment, uh, it would create uh, jobs uh, as also is uh, promoted uh, in the EU under the Green Deal. Uh, loss of public trust. Uh, the general public expects, of course, when they collect and, and separate uh, their waste streams uh, at their household, they kind of expect the government or the companies contracted by the government to take care of, uh, of, of those waste streams. And 
if they then have to find through uh, public uh, uh, to, to, to news outlets or, or uh, on, uh, on the internet found out that this waste is going uh, abroad and not being treated as they expected, uh, the general public is also less inclined to, to keep separating uh, the waste, for example. And also um, the loss of resources. Uh, if waste is not properly uh, collected and treated, uh, in the instance of, of electronic waste, uh, which contains a lot of uh, uh, valuable metals, um, if, if this is not treated in, in, in a good manner, uh, you will lose these uh, this, this, this resources. Uh, and this will become a few, more and more a challenge in the future. Uh, for example, looking to, to uh, yeah, the increased use of lithium batteries. Uh, and lastly, what is sometimes also not uh, always so obvious is that uh, uh, waste trafficking is, in, in, uh, is often linked with other types of, uh, of crime, uh, fraud, uh, money laundering, uh, bribery, other financial crimes. Uh, so it's not just waste trafficking, it's, it's also impacting uh, uh, other areas. So what are some of the challenges um, that we face when we're trying to detect, prevent and enforce uh, cases of, uh, of, uh, of waste crime? Um, the list that you see on the screen is not, of course, uh, exhaustive, but it highlights some of the, of the key challenges um, that we have come across uh, over the years. Uh, so first of all, the, the gathering of information uh, as set. Uh, waste is shipped from A to B, but it stops in different ports or in different places. Uh, and to gather information on, on the composition of the waste or how it has been uh, generated, uh, where is it going to, what type of treatment, uh, that's already quite, uh, quite challenging. And uh, if you look to the number of containers being shipped day on a daily basis and how many of them contain waste, uh, law enforcement authorities need to have proper information to target the right uh, containers, for example, to, 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 yeah, to check and to see if they're dealing with, uh, with illegal or an illegal shipment of waste. Uh, another challenge is, again, the cross-border aspect uh, of, uh, of the waste trade. You're dealing with different jurisdictions, so not all uh, countries, of course, have the same um, uh, mandate or legal power uh, to, to act upon uh, illegal shipments of waste. Uh, and we're also dealing with different authorities that are involved in the waste trade chain, like uh, the environmental authorities uh, and inspectorates, the ministries, uh, but of course also customs and, and port authorities. Uh, so that makes it extra challenging to have a good uh, level uh, of, of uh, communication. Uh, legal definitions uh, is another challenge, as said, if, if we don't have clear definitions, for example, on, on waste, on, on hazardous waste, or uh, uh, how much certain waste streams can be uh, contaminated with other materials, uh, that will, that will uh, yeah, tr make it even uh, more difficult for, for law enforcement to come to the same Conclusion, for example, so it can happen that one country says, no, we don't see this as, as waste and another country where it's going to they say, we consider this as a waste. Um, so uh, what does then uh, prevail? And in, it should be, of course, that the most stringent uh, interpretation is, uh, is the one that applies, but uh, it's, uh, it's very challenging. Uh, then if we are dealing with an illegal shipment of waste, uh, in some cases that waste has to return to the country of origin, uh, that gives a whole uh, new range of challenges um, about the actual return of the waste. First of all, the, 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 comp the competent authorities of the country where the, where the waste was found have to prove sufficiently to the country of export uh, that it is indeed a case of illegal waste uh, and then the actual logistics on, on returning the waste um, again can be quite time consuming and also very very costly in case the waste cannot be returned at least alternative treatment of the waste have, have to be sought in the country where it ended up uh, and lastly uh, investigations and sanctioning uh, in case an illegal shipment has been uh, detected in the country where it was uh, exported to uh, whose responsibility is it then to, to start an investigation and to, to, uh, yeah, to prepare perhaps, uh, perhaps a case? 
the collection of evidence uh, is bound by international uh, agreements on, on uh, yeah, joint committees or, uh, or teams. Uh, and even if you would get a case to, to court, uh, the, the, the san uh, sanctioning and penalties are quite uh, low. So I don't know if you saw the, the list. Um, so looking forward, what is key for disrupting uh, waste crime? Uh, very linked, of course, to the challenges that I mentioned before, uh, clear definitions um, of, of key concepts in, uh, in waste management and waste uh, treatment. Uh, uh, provisions. Uh, what are the offenses? Uh, you know, a clear description of what offenses are uh, are very helpful for law enforcement and prosecution of cases. And then, if you're lucky enough to have a case being brought to court, the the sanctions must be effect, effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. Uh, if we see now the low level of fines that companies get when illegally shipping waste, uh, they just take it as a cost, and they will continue. Uh, and it's not at that level that they will think twice and try to uh, comply with the regulation uh, at this point in time. Uh, we also uh, keep pushing for sufficient legal powers for law enforcement. Uh, so uh, even though it's maybe not one authority, but the chain of, uh, of, of, uh, of events, uh, all competent authorities or law enforcement authorities should be able to either detect or stop or investigate, uh, take samples, uh, things, uh, things like that. And that also would mean that there should be sufficient cooperation between those uh, different authorities, uh, not only at the national, but also at the regional and international uh, level. And as I said, uh, it's, it, there should be even further guidance or more clear on how to deal with the return of, uh, of illegally shipped waste. I have to say that at the uh, Secretary of the Basel Convention, uh, they, they have developed a guidance on how to deal with the re repatriation of, of shipment of waste. But this is very much focusing only on the environmental authorities. But again, also customs, uh, customs officers play a, play a big role in this. So how do you get these uh, different ministries to, to talk to each other? I'm nearly there. Uh, so just two examples of, uh, of, of how... Sorry, Nancy, we'll, we'll need yeah. to wrap in, in a yeah. minute because we'll, then we need to move to the next session. Yeah, so, that's so. my two last slides. So uh, I will just mention that uh, the UNODC has developed this uh, legislative guide, uh, which helps parties to, to, to develop a legislative framework. So it contains examples of provisions, for example, uh, that they can implement into their, into their national legislation. Uh, I think it will be launched uh, at, at the COP of the Basel Convention. Uh, and then the second um, piece of legislation I just wanted to highlight is the Environmental Crime Directive uh, uh, in the uh, European Union. Uh, it's currently under uh, revision and uh, it seems like they will focus more on, on yeah, appropriate sanctioning, a clear description of criminal offences, uh, what is the concept of substantial damage and strengthening the, uh, the enforcement chain. And then to the last slide, these are just some examples of joint initiatives uh, that have been carried out to facilitate this cross-border cooperation. Um, uh, these are some projects uh, that have been carried out the last couple of years. Uh, my only question that I would like to end with uh, is uh, if these kind of projects are enough or do we need a more... Um, yeah, more proper piece of work or legislation or framework uh, that kind of forces uh, parties and authorities to work clo more closely together uh, in this area. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Nancy. And we are out of time, so uh, but I hope we've answered those questions that were posted on uh, on the chat. And just to say, the Basel COP is coming up just in a couple of weeks in uh, in June. So thank you so much to, to all the, the, the presentations because really interesting, uh, some very thought provoking, uh, some really interesting questions and, and very interesting examples. Thank you everyone. And uh, I invite everybody to join the next session which will be on the role of networks to advance environmental law under the Montevideo program. And with that, I wish you all good afternoon, evening, morning or night respectively in your regions. Thank you.